Let us rejoice together and be seated, turning in our Bibles to Luke chapter 20. We are in Passion Week, Palm Sunday. We have examined and seen our Lord's offering of Himself as the King of Israel. We have gone to the Monday morning cleansing of the temple, and we are still in Tuesday of Passion Week with opposition to our Lord's cleansing of the temple. Number one, His teaching and His healing. Number two, and last week, those who came to question the source or origin of His authority. Sorry. Luke chapter 20, verses 9 through 19. Let us give attention to the Word of God. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey for a long time. At the harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine growers so that they would give him some of the produce of the vineyard. But the vine growers beat him, sending him away empty-handed. And he proceeded to send another slave. And they beat him also and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he proceeded to send a third. And this one also they wounded and cast out. The owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the vine growers saw him, they reasoned with one another, saying, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy these vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. When they heard it, they said, May it never be. But Jesus looked at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. The scribes and the chief priests tried to lay hands on him that very hour, and they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke this parable against them. Very common in Galilee, a productive agricultural economy. There were villages. There was a Greek city, Sepphoris. It stretched northward and to the border of the Gentiles. But there were large, what we might think of in our culture today or in earlier days, particularly in the southern region of these United States, were plantations owned by absent, absentee landlords. They were not plantations growing cotton or peaches. They were, plant, they were vine Vineyards tended by vine growers. Wealthy landowners would purchase them at a depressed price, put in a fence, a tower, and a wine press, and lease out the vineyard to vine growers on a sharecropping basis. That is to say, the vine growers who leased the property would be able to keep some of the produce some of the, the um, productivity of the land, and then they would give a portion prearranged in amount to the owner. So it was a land investment and a crop investment for the owner. And we think that he must not have been a Galilean because in this particular parable that Jesus teaches, it says he has gone on a long journey. This indicates spatial distance. So probably, first of all, he is an absentee landlord, and secondly, he probably lives at some distance 
and does not visit frequently. But we turn another page in the Bible to Isaiah chapter 5, and we find that vineyard, the vineyard in this particular account given by Isaiah, a vineyard is an image, a metaphor for Israel and the people of God. The vineyard is planted by God, and then he looks for the fruit of obedience to the Torah and faithfulness to the covenant. And unfortunately, but predictably to those who read the scriptures regularly, in Isaiah chapter 5, he receives no fruit. But Isaiah chapter 5 etched in the mind of the Israelites that vineyards were a picture, a depiction, an image of Israel itself. And God was the one who planted and tended the vineyard. So this was common knowledge among the hearers of our Lord Jesus Christ this Tuesday morning in the temple precincts. He's teaching them they are aware of the image and the image of those who, who tended a vineyard. But the story is slightly different. Even though the hearers would have rec recognized immediately that Israel is the vineyard, in this case, the owner sends slaves, indicating his wealth once again. Undoubtedly, he has bought this vineyard and this land at a depressed price. The market has been down. He sees the opportunity. He has capital to invest. He buys the vineyard. He then, in Matthew and Mark, we have a fuller account of this same parable. He puts in fences. He puts in a, a tower and a wine press. And so this is, once again, for him, a, a venture capital, but also what appears to be a sound investment. The land may rise once again in value, and meanwhile, he's able to have a portion of the fruit of the field. So things are going well until he sends one of his slaves, perhaps here at the first harvest time, we're not sure. Perhaps the vines had just been planted, and it would take four to five years for a vine to mature. But anyway, at a particular time that appears to be favorable, the owner of the vineyard dispatches one of his trusted slaves to take his portion, receive his portion of the fruit of the field. Well, frankly, the vine growers are a miserable lot. They have no intention of sharing what they may believe to be in the early years, a meager profit from the vineyard. But they not only send him away empty-handed, but they physically mistreat him. They beat him and send him away, undoubtedly causing consternation and upset for the owner. But as the parable unfolds, apparently he waits until the next harvest season. And then he dispatches yet another one of his faithful slaves entrusted with the responsibility of looking over the vineyard, checking the condition of the, of the fields, looking at the vines, looking at the wine press, looking at the fences. This has been a capital investment for his, for his owner. He comes to receive a portion from the prophets and once again... It's not yet becoming redundant, but it's becoming predictable. These individuals who have rented the vineyard are not going to give to the owner the fruit of the field or any percentage agreed upon or not of the profits of this capital venture. Well, by the time we've reached verse 11, we've been walking through the verses all along. By the time we reach verse 11, we expect another episode similar to the first two. And we are not disappointed, or perhaps we are disappointed, because a third slave is dispatched. And verse 12 tells us this one, they physically assault violently. 
This one also they wounded and cast out. The owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? Well, now we have a picture that the listeners understood. Clearly, just a few verses from now, we'll see that they understood what the parable intended. But here, in this situation, they are ones who have resisted three continual efforts of the owner to receive some profit from his venture. But in the mind of the hearers, they recognize that it is a picture, and now you and I recognize it too, it is a picture of prophets that have been sent to Israel. Well, the vineyard is Israel. That was common knowledge and a, and a metaphor and an image that all Israelites knew, not just from Isaiah chapter 5, but other places in the Old Testament prophets. Israel is the vineyard, and therefore we should not be surprised in John chapter 15 of the New Testament, Jesus says, I am the vine. This is a very familiar part of the agricultural economy of the Middle East, and particularly Galilee, it was obvious Jesus' intent in the parable that the vineyard is Israel and the vine growers are the people who resist the ones that are sent. Who are the ones who are sent? The prophets. So what we have is an image-laden picture of Israel's history. Time after time. After a long time, God has sent his prophets to Israel. Time and again, he sends them with a message of his love and forgiveness or of their need to return to the covenant and obey the precepts of the Torah. Different prophets with different messages, but all calling Israel to fidelity and obedience to the covenant that God had made with them but the result is painfully similar in each case. The prophets are rejected. <clears throat> Back now to the occasion of the parable. The owner is puzzled, distraught, and doesn't know what to do. So there is, as is often in Luke, there's a little soliloquy given in verse 13. He thinks aloud, what shall I do? I know what I'll do. I'll send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. And to a Christian reader, it is obvious that now in the fullness of time, God is going to send his son to Israel. Surely, the sense of the passage is, surely they will respect my son, my beloved son, implies my one and only son. But the beloved son terminology not only reveals that the individual is willing to send his son, is willing to send his son, but that Jesus, as he tells the parable, is self-consciously aware that he is the beloved son. Jesus does not just tumble to the idea of his divine sonship. He's constantly aware of that. And in this parable, he states that it is the beloved son of the father who has sent the prophets who is identified as Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus is self-consciously aware of his identity as the beloved son. Quite a particular point, I think, in the parable. But not only is he aware that he is the divine son, the beloved one and only. But he's aware of what is going to happen to him in Passion Week in the providence of God. Because these who have rented, as it were, the vineyard, do the same thing to the son that they had done to the previously sent slaves. However, this time they conclude, if we kill his son... Then we can seize the inheritance of the vineyard. This could be extrapolated in a number of different ways, 
but that's not the significant point. The point is that they believe by killing the son, they will rid themselves of the onus of responsibility to the owner, and they will be able to possess the vineyard and all of its fruits. They will be in command. So in the parable, the owner still far away on a long journey, sends his beloved one and only son, and in fact they do mistreat him, kill him, and throw him out of the vineyard. Jesus is aware of his identity as the one and only son, beloved of the Father. Jesus is aware of his destiny, that he will be crucified and brought to death. All this is apparent, but Jesus is telling this to the crowds that came to hear him at the temple. Remember, we're Tuesday, probably somewhere late in the morning on Tuesday. We've had the earlier confrontation in verses 1 through 8. So this is his response to their querying him. Now he's telling a parable about them. God has continually sent across the centuries... God has sent prophet after prophet after prophet to his covenant people. In this instance, only three, but in reality, quite a few more. And the response has been predictable. They are mistreated, thrown out of the vineyard, which God, as the owner of the vineyard, is seeking to cultivate by his word. They have thrown them out and continued in their disobedience. This has been the characteristic storyline of Israel since God planted them as a nation. Even the beloved son is not sufficient to arrest their attention and for them to respond to the message of the prophets that God sends. Well, a question is asked in verse, the concluding part of verse 15, which brings us near, near the end of the story with the image once again of a vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Verse 16, he will come and destroy those vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. Very plainly interpreted, God is going to bring judgment upon the daughter of Zion, which we saw from Zechariah, is, is Jerusalem. God is going to bring judgment upon them and turn over the kingdom of God to others who will believe and receive the Son and the message of redeeming love. Well... The only place in the New Testament where we have, may it never be, I'm not sure what your translation may say, may say, God forbid, may it never be, but this is the only place outside of Paul where this phrase occurs. And it occurs somewhat surprisingly and hopefully, it occurs in the mouths of those who are hearing the parable. They appear to catch the gist of it all. That their leaders are in fact like those who rented the vineyard. They have resisted the prophets and now they are resisting the preeminent one who has come. And the result is the eventual destruction of Jerusalem and the removal of the kingdom of God from the auspices of the Jewish apostles to a very strong Gentile representation. As Paul says, I will take the message to the Gentiles, they will hear. So this is what's happened. The vineyard, is going, the vineyard uh, producers who have rented the vineyard, they are going to be destroyed and the vineyard is going to be given to others. And the listeners to the parable are appalled and horrified. Is this really the condition of our leaders? That our leaders are going to be responsible in the rejection of this prophet? If we look in the Gospel of Matthew and Mark, it says there that 
the leaders of the Jewish people, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, were afraid to arrest Jesus because of the crowds, because they considered him a prophet. So here's the last in a succession of prophets, and the leaders are going to reject him, and the result is going to be the destruction of the daughter of Zion, a poetic term describing Jerusalem, and the turning over of the kingdom of God to a predominantly Gentile church. Now we have one of those pictures in the Bible that just everyone likes. I think it's unanimous. And I want to take you there. In the ancient world, stones and rocks were used, taken from rock quarries and the, used by stonemasons to construct blocks, some of them enormous in size, to anchor and align a building that was built. And so they would come together, anchoring and aligning a corner. And if that corner is out of order and that rock is not properly masoned and hewed, that then there is, is a misalignment. And the building in its structure and strength may be reduced. Now, together... I'm going to ask that we turn to Psalm 118. This is a messianic psalm, and in it, it takes us to the rock quarry and gives us a proverb that was common among the people of the ancient world. We're going to be looking at a simple proverb, an expression. We have expressions like, the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. It's sort of a saying that everyone knows. It's performance, not words that count. Well, in the ancient world, they had proverbs just like we do, proverbial sayings just like we have. And in Psalm 118, there is a picture in verse 22 of this process of selecting a particular stone to be at the corner of a building that is being constructed. And that chief cornerstone is critical to anchor and align the building that is being constructed. And so it's very important that the builders make a wise selection in composition, in cutting, in size. It requires the skill and we might even say the architectural acumen to select the stone that is best suited to give proper strength and alignment to the corner of the building. But in the ancient world, there was a proverb of humiliation. Builders rejecting a stone from being the cornerstone of the building. We would say it like this, oh, he's just a rejected stone. This means he's been examined, he's been looked at and perhaps measured and, 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 and evaluated, and the builders have rejected that stone from being a cornerstone. I know some of you keep notes, and if you do, you might want to jot down Jeremiah 51.26. There's another reference where God tells the Babylonians that there will not be a cornerstone in their land. And so this image of a cornerstone being rejected was a picture of humiliation. Builders rejecting the, 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 this particular stone is rejected. In a sense, it's not fit to be a cornerstone. And so it's basically, it's tossed on the rubbish heap or used for some other building, perhaps building um, something else. So we speak of a rejected stone. In chapter, tw chapter and pardon me, in verse 22 of Psalm 118, the reference is to Israel, that the nations of the earth look at Israel as a rejected stone. 
And so the mighty kingdoms of Assyria or Babylonia or Persia or on and on, Rome, Greece, Greece, Rome, all of these nations of the earth looked at Israel as, in terms of a world power, as a rejected stone. Yes, they had prosperity and somewhat of a place of power in the days of David and Solomon. That is true. Solomonic glory is a fact that took place historically. But ordinarily, Israel was looked upon as a rejected stone, a cultural backwater place that had only its religious phenomenon as any claim to fame whatsoever. Her armies were not great, and so on. So in Psalm 118 and verse 22, the psalmist is making an evaluation. He's saying, The nations of the earth have been to the rock quarry, evaluated Israel, and rejected it. It's not fit to be a cornerstone as a world power. But in God's doing, that which was rejected, the cornerstone, the, excuse me, the stone that is rejected by the builders, God takes that stone and makes it the cornerstone. What man humiliates and rejects, God chooses and exalts. And so in the psalm, the psalmist is saying, the nations of the earth have looked upon us as a rejected stone, but the Lord is using that rejecting stone to be the cornerstone, and then he follows up with the words in verse 22. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. God has taken despised and lowly Israel and made Israel the cornerstone of his work in the world, whereas the nations of the earth rejected it. But in reality, God has chosen that stone to be the cornerstone. And I know that there are study Bibles and commentaries. Uh, I think the New International Version, for example, translates it capstone. So some people think it's referring to capstone or, or a stone in an archway. But it seems possible that the best way to look at it is the cornerstone. But at all events, whichever one of those stones it may be, it is the most important component of the building that has been rejected by builders, but taken and received and used by God. Now, look back at Luke chapter 20. Jesus is saying, haven't you ever read that verse? That that which man rejects and humiliates, and it becomes a byword and a proverb, a rejected stone. Haven't you ever read that the rejected stone is that which God takes and uses to be the cornerstone of a magnificent building? And Jesus is saying the leaders like the vine growers, the leaders are rejecting me. I'm a rejected stone. But God is taking that which the builders chose to reject and God is going to use this cornerstone to construct a magnificent building in effect saying a new Israel. That Jesus is going to be what Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2. That Christ is the cornerstone. But phenomenally, the, the, the leaders of Israel, just like the vine growers who rented the vineyard from the wealthy landowner, the leaders have rejected Jesus as a rejected, he's a rejected stone, humiliated. God has taken and exalted him and is using him to be the cornerstone of the building. And the godly man who writes Psalm 118 says, this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Look what God does with lowly Jesus of Nazareth. He makes him the cornerstone of the church of Jesus Christ. And built upon his death, burial, and resurrection, God will erect a new Israel, the church of Jesus Christ. 
And Jesus said, haven't you read that? Like so many other times when Jesus said that, they'd read it, but they didn't quite have the interpretation that Jesus' brilliance and knowledge deduces and gives. So Jesus says, he looks at them and says, what does it mean then that the stone, stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone? Jesus, the leaders in the quarry rejected him, but God exalts him. And he is the cornerstone. Now, if you'd like to, I'll read it for you. It's Acts chapter 4 and verse 11. This passes into the regular testimonials of the Christian church. Peter and John are arrested. This is Acts chapter 4. Peter and John are arrested. And they're arrested for healing a man. And so they're being interrogated, much as Jesus was. And there's an assembly, verse 6 in chapter 4, Annas and John and Alexander and all who were of high priestly descent. They put them in the center. They began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? By what authority? The same question is asked of Jesus in chapter 20, the first eight verses. What authority, who's giving you the authority to heal this man? Who's... What rabbinical school are you from? What priestly descent have, have you derived from? And so forth. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He, that is Christ, is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. So you have the apostles recognizing this particular verse as being applied to Jesus, and they say to the leaders of the people, Jesus was rejected and crucified by you, but God took and made him the chief cornerstone of the people of God. And it's in his name, that whom you rejected, it is in his name that you are, that we have made this man well. Jesus concludes with a slightly different picture, but nevertheless of a stone still. In verse 18, he said, Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. And we have the picture of a somewhat fragile pottery. Pottery is not going to have the same density and um, <clears throat> hardness that one of these building stones would have. So if you take a piece of pottery and you drop it on a building stone, it's going to shatter the pottery. Or if you take and drop the stone on the pottery, it's going to shatter. And Jesus is saying, those who reject the stone are going to be shattered. They're going to be made like dust. They're going to be judged conclusively and with finality for rejecting the stone that God put into place as the cornerstone. So it's a marvelous picture that, that begins with the familiar vineyard, the familiar landlord, the sending of the beloved son, and God taking the rejected stone from the proverb and making him the exalted one upon whom he builds the kingdom of God in the decades and centuries to come. And those who resist him will fall upon him like a piece of pottery or the rock will fall on the piece of pottery. In any eventuality, the pottery is shattered. And verse 19 tells us they have the same response and the same dilemma. The scribes and the chief priests tried to lay hands on him that very hour, but they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke this parable against them. They knew what he was saying, that he was the cornerstone. And they wanted to lay hands. They never consider repentance. They seek to lay hands on him. 
And over in the Matthew, in Matthew and Mark, it says the people considered Jesus a prophet. Now, we have as our Lord a rejected Messiah. The leaders rejected Him, but God did a wonderful thing. He took that rejected stone and made it the cornerstone of the church of God that one day will be the stone from Daniel that fills the whole earth and is successful in conquering the nations of the earth for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be careful what we reject. God may take, take, take what we reject and use it for quite something else. And so I would say to all of us, if we maybe feel down and out and maybe a little bit um, rejected in life, God may use you to be a cornerstone for something that is very important in His work. It's a pattern that is found throughout the Scripture and illustrated from the rock quarry of Palestine. Let's come to the Lord's table.